Thank you, Madam President. It is barely a week since this Council met to discuss the situation in the Middle East. One would think that we have reconvened today to address the rampant violence and bloodshed that plagues the region between the Mediterranean Sea and the Arabian Sea. After all, the past few days have seen untold suffering. In Iraq, a suicide bomber drove into a security checkpoint and killed 38 people. In Lebanon, militants linked to Al-Qaeda launched an attack on the central market, leaving 42 people dead and 150 people wounded. In Syria, 500 people were killed and injured in seven days of the regime's aerial bombardment. In Iran, a 26-year-old woman named Rania Jabari was executed for killing a man who tried to rape her. In Saudi Arabia, three lawyers were sentenced to eight years behind bars for tweeting messages that, quote, undermine the judiciary. This is a relatively light sentence in Saudi Arabia, which has beheaded 59 people so far this year. Most of the millions of men and women being oppressed in our region are completely ignored by this council. They are cast aside to make way for a litany of half-truths, myths, and outright lies about Israel. I'm here to convey one simple truth. The people of Israel are not occupiers and we're not settlers. Israel is our home and Jerusalem is the eternal capital of our sovereign state. There are many threats in the Middle East. But the presence of Jewish homes in the Jewish homeland has never been one of them. And yet, this is the issue that we have convened to discuss today. It says a great deal that the international community is outraged when Jews build homes in Jerusalem, but doesn't say a word when Jews are murdered for living in Jerusalem. The hypocrisy is appalling. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The primary obstacle to peace is not settlements. This is just a pretext for the Palestinians to avoid making painful compromises. The primary obstacle to peace is the Arab world's refusal to acknowledge that Israel is the nascent state of the Jewish people, refuse to acknowledge Jerusalem as the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Madam President, throughout history, Jerusalem has been the capital for one people and only one people, the Jewish people. I'm holding a Bible which details almost 4,000 years of Jewish history in the land of Israel. In it, we read about our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who traveled Jerusalem rolling hills. We read about King David, who laid the cornerstone for his palace over 3,000 years ago. That's King David from Bethlehem, not King David from the West Bank, and certainly not King David from the occupied territories. And in the Bible, we read about King Solomon, who constructed the first temple. Jerusalem is a divine promise to the Jewish people. Following the destruction of our temple and the Babylonian exile, the great Jewish leader, Nehemiah, led the Jewish people back to Israel, saying, let me quote, V'amar l'amelech, אם על המלך טוב, ואם ייטב עבדך לפניך, אשר תשלחני אל יהודה, אל עיר קברות אבותיי, ואבננה. Then I prayed to the God of heaven, let him send me to the city of Judah, Jerusalem, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Jerusalem is central to our identity, and to our tradition. The holy city is named more than 900 times in the Bible. On holidays, we sing Lashana Ba'ab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. For thousands of years, through persecutions and massacres, expulsions and crusades, blood libels and pogroms, Jews turn their hearts in prayer towards Jerusalem. The connection between the Jewish people and our capital cannot be denied. And nothing you would say here would do that. Jerusalem is Mount Zion and Mount Moria and the Temple Mount. To walk in this place is to follow the footsteps of our forefathers and to feel the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people. 
The Palestinians and others have had the audacity to accuse us of trying to alter historical Jewish character of our ancient city? Really? The truth of the matter is that Jerusalem had a Jewish character long before more, most cities in the world had any character. It was the capital of the Jewish people long before Homer composed the Iliad, before Romulus and Remus founded Rome, and before the armies of Alexander the Great swept across the Middle East. Jerusalem is steeped in Jewish history in an effort to erase all traces of the religious and historical ties between Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, the Waqf is deliberately destroying archaeological evidence. Each and every one of you knows that. The United Nations knows that. Are you out there? Are you saying anything? They even brought in a fleet of bulldozers and removed 6,000 tons, not, you know, a little bit, 6,000 tons of earth from the southeast corner of the Temple Mount, known also as Solomon Stables, with every shovel full of soil. They are trying to shovel away Jewish history. But you don't need at the United Nations a research institute to find that out. The Palestinians wish to secure a brighter future. They might stop rewriting history and start making history by making peace. They must abandon the destructive rhetoric. A people can only build a brighter future if they make peace with the past. If not, it will be held captive by the chains of resentment and hatred and pass a legacy of violence and intolerance to the next generation. Madam President, Former Israeli prayer, prayer Prime Minister Menachem Begin said that if an enemy of the Jewish people says he seeks to destroy us, believe him. Don't doubt him for a moment. If history has taught the Jewish people anything, it is that we must make and take calls for our destructions seriously. Hamas's genocidal char charter calls for the destruction of Israel and the murders of Jews worldwide. Some in this institution don't have the courage to mention Hamas by name, never mind condemning the terrorist group for its crime. Hamas deliberately targets our civilians by blowing up buses and restaurants, kidnapping and murdering teenagers, shooting rockets in our cities, and building terror tunnels into our towns. That's Hamas. What about the leader of the Palestinian Authority, President Abbas? Well, he is the reason that we are sitting here today. You see, he's orchestrating a campaign to vilify Israel, and you seem willing to play second fiddle. Let me remind you about the conductor behind the accusations that you heard today. Palestinian President Abbas wrote a dissertation denying the Holocaust and educates Palestinian children to hate Jews. In schools, mosques, media, generations of Palestinian children are being taught to hate, vilify and dehumanize Israelis and Jews. In his remarks in the General Assembly last month, each and every one of you heard that, President Abbas delivered a hate-fueled attack and accused Israel of the worst crimes, including genocide. Earlier this month, he called on Palestinians to prevent Jews from visiting the Temple Mount, using, and I quote, all means necessary are these the words of a leader committed to making peace? Now, I didn't hear that in the briefing by Under Secretary Jeffrey Feldman. The video of his hateful remarks, it's not just in general, the both sides. The video of his hateful remarks was broadcast on official Palestinian authority and television 19 times in three days. 19 times in three days. That's not someone who's not relevant, second tier. The result of these inflammatory remarks were almost immediate. Hundreds of Arabs rioted in Jerusalem, damaging the right rail system, and Hamas terrorists deliberately drove full speed onto a Jerusalem train platform, killing two people. Did President Abbas express outrage or remorse over the senseless killing? Of course not. Couldn't even muster the courage to denounce an attack it left a three-month-old baby dead. 
Rather than trying to extinguish the flames of the conflict, the Palestinian leadership is adding fuel to the fire. First, they incite violence on the Temple Mount, and then they run to the Security Council to complain about the consequences. If that's not manufacturing a crisis, I don't know what is. Now, let's try to follow the logic here. Palestinians extremists have turned the Temple Mount into a battleground by throwing stones and Molotov cocktails at visitors and police. That's phrased as allegedly throwing stones. Allegedly throwing stones? Why well, can we can build the whole quarry from the stones that allegedly were thrown? In doing so, they're preventing Muslims from praying at the holy site. Israeli police are forced into harm's way to restore quiet, and then the Palestinians come to the Security Council complaining about Israel's activities on the Temple Mount. Do you have trouble following this logic? I certainly do. But I can tell you this, it both starts and ends with irresponsible actions of the Palestinian leadership. Madam President, Palestinians had the audacity to come to this council and speak about religious freedoms? Let me tell you how much the Palestinian Authority cares about holy sites. Take Shechem, which has been under control of the Palestinian Authority since 1995. Shechem was home to the grave of the biblical patriarch Joseph. Palestinian vandals broke into the sacred site, burned Jewish prayer books, and reduced the building to rubble. In Bethlehem, which is also under Palestinian control, violent extremists have looted and desecrated the Church of Nativity, one of Christians' holiest sites. It's a result of this persecution that they face the city's Christian population has fallen and decreased by nearly 70%. It isn't just the Palestinians that have impinged on religious freedoms. I would like to remind this council that from 1948 till 1967, Jerusalem was under Jordanian rule. Jerusalem was divided. Everyone could come in and visit Judaism, holy sites, except the Jews. They were denied access. Following Israel's victory in 1967, Israel reunited Jerusalem. Since then, all people, and I mean all people, regardless of religion, nationality, can visit the city's holy sites. And while we were victorious and assumed control all over Jerusalem, Israel extended a hand in peace to the Muslim world. According to the status quo, brokered between Israel and the Waqf, Muslims would enjoy access to pray at the holy sites, while all other religions would be allowed to access the Temple Mount. That was the case up to a couple of years back. Israel went one step further than that, talking about religious freedoms, and decided that Jews would not be allowed to pray on this site. I want to make sure you understand this. The Temple Mount is Judaism's holiest place, but we were willing to restrict our own freedoms for the sake of peace. Can you think of another nation that would make this compromise? Can you think of another religion that would make this sacrifice? Today, Jerusalem under Israeli authority is united, united for Muslims, united for Christians, and united for Jews. As Prime Minister Netanyahu reiterated this week, and I quote, we're maintaining the status quo and allowing everyone access to the holy places, and we shall continue to do so." End of quote. Israel is doing everything in its power to minimize tensions. Even when riots break out, Israeli security forces acting in coordination with the Jordanian government refrain from entering the mosque and its courtyard unless there is an imminent threat to the site and its visitors. The Palestinians, on the other hand, are doing everything in their power to inflame tensions. The Waqf has violated the status quo agreement by restricting access to Judaism's holiest place, the place where we believe that God began the act of creation, where Abraham brought his son Isaac, and where Jacob fell asleep and dreamed of angels. Today, a Jew who wishes to visit the sacred site is threatened with violence. But you don't have to take my word for it. Earlier this month, Hanan Ashawi, also not hard to find out, 
a prominent member of the PLO Executive Committee, said, and I quote, that allowing Jews to visit the Temple Mount is a declaration of war against Islam, end of quote. These are irresponsible words of a person trying to ignite a religious war. You don't have to be Catholic to visit the Vatican. You don't have to be a Jew to visit the Western Wall. But the Palestinians would like to see the day when the Temple Mount is only open to Muslims, and that will not take place. Madam President, I speak before this council today as a proud representative of the Jewish state and the Jewish people, a people who's bond to the land of Israel and its eternal capital of Jerusalem extends back almost 4,000 years. I'm proud to represent an ancient people who have outlived history's most daunting empires. Where is the ambassador of Babylon? Where is the ambassador of Caesar's Rome? Where is the ambassador of Mesopotamia? They have been relegated to history, while we, the Jewish people, continue to stand tall, stand tall against the trials and tests of time. We are a nation with deep roots in the past and bright hope for the future. It is time for the Palestinians to realize that the children of Abram, all children of Abram, Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, are not doomed to live together in war, but rather destined to live together in peace. Israel will continue to strive for peace while fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Al chomotai Yerushalayim hefkadti shomrim kol hayom vekol alayla tamid lo yechashu. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they shall never be silent. Israel will never be silent. We will stand guard and we will safeguard Jerusalem, not just for the Jewish people, but for people of all faiths. And so today, I issue this promise from the people of the promised land. Under our watch, Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the Jewish people, will remain a free and open city for all people and for all time. Thank you, Madam President.